Okay, we have now seen the general plan of how factorizations work and we have already seen uh, Paul's row method. And now we're going to go for the p-1 method. Now the p-1 method is also due to Pollard, so there's a, a lot of Pollard in computational number theory and therefore in cryptology, which is, well, using this kind of number theory. Um, let me start by motivating the p-1 method with a somewhat surprising fact. So here we're taking a number 2 to the s minus 1, where s is a well pretty large number, so that's uh, 232 million something. And then I'm computing this 2 to the s minus 1, so this is a number which has 232 million bits, but okay, the computer can handle this, and then I'm asking, hey, computer, tell me how many of the primes up to a thousand divide this number. Now out of these 168 primes, 70 are devices of it. So roughly half of it, slightly less. And then, okay, looking at the primes up to 10,000, 156 of those. So each time we're getting a bunch of new primes. And for the small primes, okay, you're taking a huge number. It's not such a surprise you're finding two, uh, you're finding three, you're finding five, seven, and so on. But for the larger numbers, for the primes up to a million, it's actually surprising that you're seeing about 180 more primes that we haven't seen before. So those are really primes between 100,000 and a million. Now I should tell you two things. One is how I chose this S, namely it's the LCM of the numbers up to 20. And remember how LCM computations work or what they imply. It means that for every prime up to 20, the largest power of this prime that is less than 20 is the divisor of S. So you can, for instance, compute this by taking for each prime power there, and then you take, or you take each prime power up there. So for instance, 9 is the highest power of 3, 16 is the highest power of 2, all the other primes appear only in single multiplicity, and then you compute 16 times 9 times 5 times 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, that's the LCM. So all of these numbers and their products divide S. Okay, so S itself has lots of factors, but also what I'm showing here is that 2 to the s minus 1 has all these factors. Now, the reason for that lies in the theorem of, well, little theorem of Lama, namely that a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p. Or I can also write this as taking a to the p minus 1 minus 1, and that is congruent to 0 mod p. For any prime p where the a is chosen that the GCT of a and p is 1, so a is less than p. Okay, how does this explain this? Well, okay, this, this a to the p minus 1 minus 1 looks very much like to the a to the s or for a equals 2 that I'm doing up there. So p is a divisor of a to the p minus 1 minus 1, and then if, s, if a, p is also a factor of m, then p divides this GCD. So this is actually how I can turn this into a factorization method. I pick a random a, I compute a to the p minus 1 minus 1, and then compute the GCD of that with m. And I know that if p, well, what p are chosen here, is a divisor of m, then p will also be a divisor of this GCD. Mm, except for the logical fallacy that I can't do that because I don't know what the p minus 1 is. I mean, I want to find p, so I can't take the p minus 1. And so what we're taking in the p minus 1 method is, well, we can't take the exponent p minus 1, we're taking some exponent s. And then, well, you might think of it as just as best practice, is you're taking some s which has lots of small prime factors. So this LCM here, this s that I've chosen here, has lots and lots of small prime factors and has lots of these combinations in there. So we hope that p is a divisor of this a to the s minus 1 with m. Well, I mean, m we know already, and it's also divisor of this first part, and then the GCT will contain m. It will contain p. Now, does this factor already? We we'll compute a to the s minus 1, we invest this effort there, computing this huge number, compute the GCT with m, and then we find p, right? Well, actually, no, because it also relies on finding another number which is not in there, because, I mean, if 
all the factors of m satisfy that their divisors of a to the s minus 1, then this a to the s minus 1 would just be 0 mod m. And then, well, the GCD of 0 and m is m, so we wouldn't learn anything. So the method relies on also having another prime as a divisor of m, so the prime where we're going to split p from q, so that for that q, a to the s minus 1 is not congruent to 0 mod to sq. So if we have a situation that there is some prime p for which it is common to 0 and some prime q for which it is not, then we'll actually split p and q. So we can factor m into smaller parts, one containing p, one containing q, in this particular case. Now, an odd prime p divides a to the s minus 1 if and only if, well, this is 0 mod p, and that means if the order of a taken mod p is a divisor of s. Now, this is guaranteed to work if p minus 1 divides s, but it's not a requirement. So the p minus 1 method, we normally say, okay, well, if p minus 1 is a divisor of s, it works. That implication is correct, but if you want an if and only if, you really have to use the order of a mod p. Simple reason for that, well, it works if the order of a mod p divides s. Okay, so here's the order, here's s. And then we also know that p minus 1 divides s. And we know that the order of a divides p minus 1 because p minus 1 is the order of p at p star of the multiplicative group. So we're getting the order of a mod p divides p minus 1, p minus 1 divides s, so then also the order divides s. But we don't need to have the step in the middle. We can just have the order of a mod p divides s. So that's when the p minus 1 method succeeds. Now, in practice, in practice, well, we don't fix 20. We fix some bound v1, which we're choosing depending on how large the number is that we want to factor. And we're picking a random a, and we're computing a to the s mod m. Let's call this thing b, because I actually want to do some more with my b. So this s is the LCM of the numbers up to v1, and we're computing b as a to the s mod m. And then the next step, we're computing b minus 1 mod m. So that's just the same GCD that, that we had on the previous slide. It's a to the s minus 1 with m. Now, in this method, we need to have that a to the s is computed efficiently. And we also want to compute modulo m at each step. So we're computing with some uh, exponentiation method where, well, want to use this many times, so this s is going to be using many times, so for each auxiliary number n that comes in, we'll be using the same s, so it's actually worth it computing a good addition chain for s. Or, well, if you're only using s1, at least use the sliding window method. We have seen fixed windows, sliding windows is a small generalization that you should be looking at. Now, there's actually something which I snuck in here, namely the computation mod m. Before that, we're just computing a to the s minus 1 and then compute the GCD here. Uh, now I also want to have the computation um, modulo m. And so for that here, um, I'm reducing mod m, which will save me some effort because that means my numbers get never larger than m while well, seeing a number up to n square and then I'm reducing. The reason I'm allowed to do that is that all I'm going to use my b for is actually this computation. I'm going to use my b in the computation of the GCD. And the first step when you're computing a GCD is you're taking the larger number, modulo the smaller number, and then you're looking at the remainder. So all that matters is actually this remainder. And computing modulo m all alone doesn't change this remainder. So we can compute this exponentiation mod m. Now the real p-1 method actually has a second stage which is improving the chances a little bit that you would actually find uh, your prime p. So if there's a small prime p, then, uh, so if there's a prime p which has an extra divisor, which is just not small enough to be less than v1, but is less than some bound v2. So let's this prime be one of these qi's. So these are all the primes between v1 and v2. Now, in that situation, you would actually be happy to also compute a power with involving this qi. 
And so that's what the stage two is doing. Namely, it computes this B, which we computed up here. That's the reason I want to save it. I compute this B1, uh, B to the Q1, compute B to the Q2, B to the Q3, etc. And so if I'm computing this product here, each times minus one, then I'm actually seeing uh, a P if the order of A mod P divides any of these SQI, or one of the I's between one and K. Uh, some fine print, I would not compute it like this. First of all, I mean, I'm writing these QIs in order. So in order to get from B to the Q1 to B to the Q2, well, I first compute the Q1, and then I compute just the difference. So B, this result to the Q2 minus Q1. This is the, this result to the Q3 minus Q1, etc., etc. So I would do those in succession. Um, and then there's also some tricks to do this. Now, we don't need those tricks here because we just want to understand how the method works. But if you ever get into using P minus one in practice, do look at those tricks because they actually save you running time. So what you might take as a lesson from this is that you're finding primes P if P minus one is smooth. So a number M that's easy to factor is one where at least one of the primes has a smooth P minus one. And so you could say, well, haha, <laughs> if you want to choose primes that are hard to find, then we define safe primes as primes where this is maximum distance from working. So we're picking our prime p so that p minus one, well, it can't be prime because it's an even number, but it's two times a prime plus one. So those numbers, often called safe primes, are certainly harder to factor with this method, with the p minus one method. These numbers actually don't offer any better resistance for any of the other methods. So certainly not for the number field SIF, which is how we're actually attacking RSA numbers, and also not for the two methods which you're going to see in this lecture. So not helping against P plus one, not helping against ECM. So it doesn't really help for RSA numbers. These are nicer for some other applications, but not for RSA. Okay, so P plus one method already announced now. I'm going to explain this using the clock group, because we have seen the clock group in the first lectures about elliptic curves. And so this is an easy way to understand the group that's going on. If you go back to the original P plus one method by Hugh Williams, you're going to see a different representation of it. But it's equivalent. It gives you the same method. So what we're going to do is we're working on the clock over the rational numbers. And we know this point P three fifths, four fifths already. So I'm going to take this point and compute some scalar multiples of it. And I'm going to take the same S that I used before, namely this 232 million something, so the LCM of the number is up to 20. And with this S, I'm going to do a scalar multiplication, taking this point P and S as a scalar, compute S times P, which is, well, some coordinate, on, some point on the clock. So the coordinates of this point, so let's call them X and Y, these are elements of Q and Q. Now I want to argue about divisibility. So for that, I need to have an integer. And you should remember that when you take multiples of this p, say you take 2p, there was a divisor, uh, denominator 25, 3p had a denominator 125, 4p is 625. In general, you're seeing, um, if you're taking s times a point, you're seeing 5 to the power of s as a denominator in this point. And so if you want to get an integer, we have to clear denominators. So S2 is an integer where we're taking this X coordinate, which is the element of Q, times the 5 to the S. Okay, so that has cleared the denominator. Now I can ask which primes divide that. And actually, it's quite a few. So there's actually more primes of the small numbers. So 82 instead of just 70 primes up to 1,000, 223 of the primes up to 10,000, etc., etc. It's not guaranteed to be better, it's sometimes better, it's sometimes worse. So these primes are found with the P plus one method using the clock arithmetic. So I can now come up with an analogous way of using this method to the P minus one method and take, well, the X coordinate, this S here, the X coordinate times two to the lowercase s and compute the GCD. 
Now, what does it mean to be a divisor of S2? It means that for those primes P, um, the x coordinate is 0 mod P. And we know two points on the clock mod P. We know two points where the x coordinate is 0, the 12 o'clock point and the 6 o'clock point. So for those primes P, we have reached one of these two points. We have reached 0, 1 or 0, minus 1 on the clock mod P. And those are the primes that we're finding. Okay, so here is the P plus 1 method. You're given some integer m, which we want to factor. You're picking the lowercase s there up to the, the LCM up to some bound p1. You're computing s. You're computing s times p, so analogous to the h to the s. And then you're taking the x coordinate. We want to have the thing that is 0 mod p. And that's all here, the x coordinate. And then we clear denominators. OK, so this is a computation mod m. And then we're computing, then we compute this GCD of S2, just compute it, with M. And we hope to find a factor of M. And then, well, we find the primes that are listed here, and several of those are not found by the P-1 method. So it's not a disjoint set, but there are several new ones that come in. So you could do the P-1 method, followed by the P-1 method, and if it didn't work with the P-1 method, you have a new chance of working with the P-1 method. So what we're doing here is we're changing from one group to another group. So I was already highlighting this group feature in analyzing the P-1 method and saying, okay, it matters what is the order of A mod P, what is the order of A in FP star. And so in the P plus 1 method, we've moved from FP star to the clock mod P. And so also the success criterion changes from being that the order of A mod P divides S to asking that the order of the point P mod the prime P, lowercase p, um, well, in this case, it's a divisor of 2 times S, not S. We're getting an extra factor of 2 because we have this ambiguity of what the uh, y coordinate is. So we're getting an extra boost, getting a 2S there instead of an S. Woo! Okay. Every little bit helps. And so we have two orders running around here. We have ord sub p of a, which is the order of a mod p in the fp star group. And we have the order of capital P of the point p, that is the order of the point in the clock group mod p. And so again, well, it definitely succeeds if the order divides, and it would already succeed. I mean, you, you guaranteed success, but it's more restrictive if the order of the clock group. So. Well, we're going to see in a moment what that is, if that would be divisor of 2x. Now, for the clock group, if p is common to 3 mod 4, then p plus 1, uh, if p plus 1 is divisor of this s number, then 5 to the sx is 0 mod 1p. Or in general, if p plus 1 divides s, then 5 to the s, and then the x coordinate of s times p is common to 0 mod p. And the proof of this is to show that there are p plus 1 points on the clock mod p for the case that p is congruent to 3 mod 4. In the case that p is congruent to 1 mod 4, there are actually p minus 1 points on the clock. So then we are actually getting the same primes that we had already gotten with the p minus 1 method. But if p is congruent to 3 mod 4, we're getting different primes. And that also explains why we're seeing different primes depending well whether 1 mod, 3, uh, mod 4 or 3 mod 4. So it definitely succeeds if p plus 1 divides s, actually if p plus 1 divides 2s, and actually it does already work if the order of p on the clock group mod lowercase p divides 2s. Okay, this was our first step in generalizing from a group fp star to the clock group. But we have seen more groups. We have seen elliptic curves. And so let me introduce to you now the elliptic curve method of factorization, also known as ECM. So it's the third of these methods we're seeing here. It is the um, most general of these methods, but the setup is just the same as before. We again fixing some bounds v1 and v2. We're putting our s, the scalar, s, the LCM of the numbers up to v1. And now instead of picking the multiplicative group mod p or the clock group mod p, we're picking an elliptic curve. And of course, we can't pick it mod p, so we pick an elliptic curve 
over the integers mod m. Typically, we just pick an elliptic curve over the integers and then we use it mod m. Now, we have this group, we have an elliptic curve over z mod m, and then we're picking some point. So that corresponds to picking the point 3 fifths, 4 fifths on the previous slide, the clock group, or to picking the a in the p minus 1 method. And then we're computing using the group operation s times p. And again, because I want to have stage 2, I'm remembering this point as r. And so stage 1 already succeeds if the x coordinate of s times p is 0 mod the prime we're trying to find. So I could already, after stage 1, do a GCD computation with the x coordinate of s times p and m. But typically we want to do stage 2 as well, so I also want to look at some extra primes. So again, the primes between p1 and p2, and I'm computing these ri, again, using whatever tricks I can find. And then I compute the product of the x coordinates of these ri's, compute the GCD of that, with m. Now all these computations happen modulo m. I don't need to highlight this anymore because I'm saying we're taking the elliptic curve over m. So that implicitly means all your computations happen with m. So this is like when you're in Sage, say this elliptic curve is now defined over the ring the integers mod m. Then all of these reductions happen mod m explicitly. Now at the end of it you're actually getting an integer mod m, this product there, and then it will tell you, hey, the GCD doesn't make sense. At that moment, you have to say explicitly, oh, I want to forget that I'm reducing mod m. I want to look at this as an integer. Okay, so then you take this integer, compute the GCD with m, and you're done. Hopefully, you're finding a prime. Now, when does this work? Same story as in the last two cases. It works if the order of this point p, the one that I've chosen here, step one, when I'm looking at the elliptic curve, not mod m, but modulo a divisor of m, so modulo sub prime p, then if the order of this prime p divides s times qi, so this point here, this ri, has, or has s times qi as a multiple of, r, uh, of p, and so if the order of p divides one of those numbers, then I've reached 0, 1, modulo this prime p. So for the Putting the x coordinate there, I'm assuming that we're using Edwards coordinates. Um, if you want to use Montgomery coordinates, and I should actually give the historical background there. So the Montgomery curves come actually from speeding up the elliptic curve method. So Peter Montgomery was sitting there speeding up ECM, which was recently introduced in the mid 80s, and then he said, "Well, I actually want to have something more efficient than using Weierstrass curves," and he came up with uh, with Montgomery curves. Now, on Montgomery curves, uh, you would be using the scalar multiplication with x coordinates only, or xz, because you're doing fractions. And then instead of using x here, you would be using the z coordinate. So z coordinate is 0 if you reach infinity. And so for Montgomery curve, instead of using x, you would be using z. On Edwards curves, it's just the x. All right, for the other methods, I could now say, well, this is the precise criterion, but it's guaranteed to work if p minus 1 or p plus 1 divides as s. Now, what's the situation with elliptic curves? Well, it's less definitive, but that's actually a feature. So, I'm allowed to vary the curve. I can go back to before step 1 and pick another curve. So, if one curve fails to factor, I just try another one. And, well, we have seen already it matters what the group order mod p is, but now for elliptic curves, this group order mod p sits in an interval. It sits in this Hass interval, which is centered around p minus 1, and then is p minus 1 minus 2 squared of p in the smallest direction, and plus 2 squared of p in the biggest direction. And so, well, maybe this group order mod p wasn't good, but then another group order mod p will be smooth. This interval contains a lot of smooth numbers. So after a reasonable number of curves, and well, it's up to me to specify what reasonable means, but after a reasonable number of curves, any prime up to a certain bound will be found. And of course, that requires me to specify what reasonable means, and that requires me to pick b1 and b2 according to this age. And that's what I'm going to do in the last few minutes of this video. Um, there's going to be some fine print, which means it's more mathy, and yes, you might want to switch off, but only switch off mentally 
stay on the video because there's going to be some final comment with some caveats about what I've said so far. Okay, so how do I have to choose B1 in order to find all the primes up to H? So we want to have something where this S, which is a number which is, well, having all the products up to B1, so it's a smooth number up to B1, that that one is likely to be a multiple of the group order. And again, it only has to be a multiple of the order of the point, but let's aim for the group order. And then it's a plausible conjecture that if you're picking P, B1 to be, oh yeah, that's a big expression, to be the exponential of the square root of this expression there. Then everything will work fine. All right, let's take a look at what this is. So if it wasn't for the square root here, then the exponential of this number here, well, exponential takes away the logs. So exponential of log h is just h. Exponential of log log h is log h. And then if you have an exponential of a product, that means, well, this thing goes on the exponent. So you wouldn't have having h to the one half plus little o of one, and you'd also have, well, a log h. So something which is h to the one half, that is an exponential algorithm. That is something which is running time h to the power of something. Now, if it's log h to the power of something, that's what we call a polynomial running time. And then this thing, because of the square root there, that is between this exponential and a polynomial time. And this we call sub-exponential. So b1 is chosen sub-exponential in h. So something which is less than exponential, but larger than polynomial. So it's sub-exponential, but super polynomial. Because of this extra square root here. So that is somewhere between something which is exponential and polynomial. And okay, with the square root, it is larger, higher, closer to exponential than cube root, etc. Okay, so we're picking this B1. And then for every prime that is less than h, and you're picking a random curve in this Hasse interval. I mean, that's what you're doing when you're picking a curve up here. You're actually fixing the order of the curve modulo p. So we're asking ourselves, how, what is the probability that a random number in here is such that the order is b smooth, b1 smooth? And that's also where this number comes from. So it's, a, it's an integer up to h, and we're asking, when is an integer up to h b1 smooth? And so far, we want to choose that it b1 such that it works. And this is exactly where the smoothest probabilities come in. So this comes from the prime number theorem. When you're looking at smooth numbers, how large, how large do you have to go? This is what comes out there. OK, so then you have a good chance of finding the group order, where good chance is 1 over b1. Well, if you have a chance of 1 over b1, you're just taking b1 different curves. Also, there's little o of 1, so it's a, it's a fudge factor. So it grows like b1, but it's not exactly b1. So you're taking b1 to the 1 plus little o of 1 curves. That means we have a good chance that one of them has group order mod p, that is b1 smooth. And we're taking, well, for each of those, we have to do the scalar multiplication. Now, if s is the LCM of the numbers up to b1, this is a number with b1 squared bits, roughly. Again, plus a little o of 1 of its bonus. And so for each of those bits, we have to do a doubling. And for many of those, we have to do an addition. Now, each of the group operations consists of many of those operations, so we're needing that many squarings and multiplications. But the exact number, well, an Edwards curve doubling cos 3m plus 4s, this exact number, that is just going to disappear in the little o of 1. So what really matters is the growth with the b1 to the square. Okay, so in total we're using b1 to the 1 plus little o of 1 curves, b1 to the 2 plus little o of 1 squaring, so a total of b1 to the 3 plus little o of 1 operations, 
And because P1 is sub-exponential in H, that is a number that is sub-exponential in H. So the time is sub-exponential in H. So of all the methods, this is the fastest we have seen so far. It is of the same complexity as any of the others, except for here we can modify the curve. So for the P plus 1 or the P minus 1 method, I don't have this flexibility. So the ECM method is the first method we're seeing with analysis, which is sub-exponential H. Pollock's row method was exponential in the primes, or squared, um, and this one is sub-exponential. And now the caveat that I announced. So here, this big red arrow. I can't actually do what I'm saying. I am not able to pick a point, uh, pick a curve, and then from there, pick a point. Because if you're given a curve and you want to compute a point on that curve, you would need to be able to compute square roots. And I can't compute square roots. In the next lecture, you're going to see that computing square roots would mean that you can actually factor. So this was a bit of a lie. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm picking my prime p, uh, sorry, my, my point p, uppercase p, together with the elliptic curve. Simplest way is, well, you pick a point with integer coordinates and you say, please compute the curve that this is on. Say you do an Edwards curve, so you have that your point, uh, your curve looks like x squared plus y squared equals 1 dx squared y squared. Well, if you're fixing x and y, this gives you d equals some expression, so d is some fraction, which you're then going to compute mod m. So picking a point that picks a curve, that actually works. Now in ECM, we often want to improve our chances to have smoothness. One is already it helps to have an Edwards curve because Edwards curve has order divisible by four. So we're improving our chances a little bit of it smooth. And there are lots of methods to pick curves that are guaranteed to have a point of small order. So you're guaranteed that you can get um, a point of order 12 or you can guarantee to have a point of order 16. So you can actually improve your chances there by picking one of those families of curves and then starting with this. But in general, since we're going to need lots of different curves, we're going to typically just pick a point, well, go through the nice ones first, and then go for other curves. All right, so this ends the ECM method. We have now seen all the sub-exponent, well, we have seen now all the cofactorization methods. We're now going to move on to how you actually factor big numbers.